not be too cerebral. Uh, we plan to be a bit bubbly about it. Um, sorry. <laughs> a big old bubbly to you. And welcome to Calcutta. I think it's on. It's on. <laughs> so 15 years, Anija, and for those of you who weren't born in the 90s, uh, you probably don't know that some of our iconic campaign lines are from this brain, uh, which I'm trying to figure out if it's wired differently. So, you didn't angry more, all bubbly, um, nothing official about it. I mean, three that are pretty much top of my mind. And Richard, how did it all begin with you? Um, thank you. It's lovely to be here. I love coming to Kolkata. And uh, uh, it, it was all... Um, it was, it was a different time, right? The 90s, it was a different world. Advertising was sexy, and brands were sexy, Pepsi was sexy, and uh, the brightest minds were going into those fields, which today perhaps are doing stand-up comedy, or writing OTT shows. All those really bright people were working in advertising those days. And uh, it was very irreverent. We didn't have so many uh, structures you know, uh, so many levels and hierarchies of getting ideas approved and so on. So one could be quite, um, you could be quite spontaneous and get things approved. So yeah, like I said, it was a different world. <laughs> so you know, your immense success there, I mean, you were one of the really, really young talks who were one of the big names. When we were kind of, you know, Ricky and Bay is kind of making a living. Anuja Chauhan was the name. I mean, we, we, we heard, we'd heard of you, <laughs> believe it or not. And from there, suddenly, you know, this whole thing of writing a novel and kind of you know, chucking it all and saying, I know to write. How did that happen? How, did, how was that transition, you know, how did that germ kind of happen in your head? No, actually, I joined advertising because I wanted to write. And I left advertising because I wanted to write. Because advertising gives you a huge budget. It gives you access to big movie stars, big movie directors. There are a lot of very shiny crayons that you can draw with. But what you can draw with the shiny crayons is extremely limited. And I wanted to draw more. I wanted to do more stuff. And, and so if I wasn't constricted by the 60 second box, in advertising if you get 60 seconds, that's a huge ad, right? That's a massive budget. So I had more to say, I was greedy, and uh, I just decided that I wanted to spread out and write more and say things that were maybe politically incorrect and say things that were not necessarily, you know, in line with a particular brand or something that would sell a commodity, but rather just thoughts that were occurring to me. Um, so, so yeah, yeah, it came out of creative uh, ambition and creative frustration. Both. And of course, uh, the first thing that struck me when I read those pricey taco girls, I mean, all those years ago, was um, that you know, it had lots of Austin in it. <laughs> but then there was this language that was entirely yours. And you know, this is pre English becoming a term. Sure. And it just, you know, it was so natural, it was so spontaneous. I grew up in Delhi and Rajasthan, it was pretty much the way we spoke. And even in Calcutta, when I was growing up, Bengalish is pretty much how people actually speak. Yeah. And there it was on paper. Um, I felt it took a lot of courage to actually take that step. You know, kind of write like that and then to believe that people would, you know, take to it. So, yeah. Jashodra, that came out of a search for authenticity. You know, in India, that's how we speak. Everybody, everyone here, uh, we are all minimum, we are bilingual. We are bilingual. We speak so many languages. Every day in our sentences, it's just bubbling. Writing any other way I thought would be dishonest. Um, because I worked in advertising, I was already very familiar with the bilingual universe. Uh, I th the first line that I wrote like that was, Ye dil mange more. You know, so which was like three words in Hindi and one word in English. But it, 
I had no problem translating that, not just in Hindi, but it was Iman Chai Lore, it was a Manusin of Lore, it went across the country in many bhashas. And it worked, because that's how we talk. And uh, as a writer, I've always tried to chase, uh, I've always tried to capture authenticity. Uh, and uh, for me, that's how people talk. And there was a school of thought that said that, you know, your books, you will not sell uh, international editions. People overseas, you know, you may not sell uh, the rights to this book in the UK or in the US or in Australia because your language is not clean. It is uh, mixed, it is English. But I said, Ari, there are 1.3 billion Indians. I'll manage your own day. So. So how did you deal with the question of, let's say, translation in India? Because you've got to retain that flavor, and then there are so many different Indian languages. So did you follow the same strategy as your Pepsi campaign? I tried to, but uh, these are languages I don't know. And I, I mean, my books are translated into all the Indian languages, but unfortunately, as I'm not an expert on any of them, I really don't know how correct those translations have been. I do know that when you write in English and you're using like maybe like slightly risque language, a lot of slang, a lot of what we call four letter words, it flies in English somehow. You know, so in English if I put in words in Hindi that are a little crude perhaps, it doesn't sound so bad. But when that book is translated in Hindi, it can sound very crude. And I was in this situation, for example, where my husband's driver, who was uh, very fond of me and very proud of me, and he said, Madam, aapka kitab Hindi mein hai, I'll buy the Hindi book and read. And he read the Hindi book. And then he told my husband, he was too embarrassed to tell me, he read the Pricey Thaku Girls in Hindi. And he said, Baut ashleel bhasha hai us kitab mein. And uh, I cannot believe that Madam would have used this language. You should speak to the translator because this is very bad. So it's always tricky. It's always tricky. But um, but like I said, everything gone, like chasing authenticity is what I try and do always. My therapist once said, you know, uh, that, uh, in a part of a completely different conversation we were having, that both abuse and terms of endearment are that much stronger in their own language. They hit harder in, 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 in a good direction. So uh, setting that aside, I mean, Having said that you, you know, wanted to get creative freedom, you wanted to write your own work, you wrote your books, and every single one of them, if I'm not mistaken, have been optioned, have been turned into films, have been turned into shows. Um, so when that happened, how did you manage to retain your creative control? See, I think that was a function of my advertising career. I spent 17 years writing ads. So obviously I had contacts in the industry. I knew people. I had people um, who sort of respected my work, you know? So that first thing happened easily. Like, like this is a known story, but you know, I actually started writing books because I was shooting a Pepsi commercial in uh, Ballard Estate in the old part of Bombay. And uh, we had a huge budget. We had, uh, we were shooting the ad in two languages. We were shooting with Charuk Khan and Saif Ali Khan. And we were shooting with Surya and Madi. And it was an ad I was very, very excited about. And when we actually went in to shoot it, I realized that we were compromising from the word go. Because I had one day, yeah sure, I had huge movie stars, I had them for one day. Nothing was happening the way I wanted it to, the way I'd visualized it. We were cutting corners, we were just wrapping things up and moving fast. And I got really depressed and really frustrated and I thought this is not what I wanted to do. And that night I went back to the hotel and I pulled out a laptop which I had been given as part of a new promotion. You know, I had just been promoted, so for the first time in my life, I had a laptop. And I opened this laptop, and I said, let me write something that gives me creative control. And I started writing a novel that first night. And when I went back to the shoot the next day, Shahrukh Khan was really sweet, and he, you know, that's just the way he is. And he said, so you were very upset yesterday. How did you decide what you're going to do about the fact that you have no creative freedom? And I told him, I'm going to write a book. And he said, okay, you write a book, Anuja, I'll make a movie out of your book. 
And that's actually how it started. So I guess it was a lot to do with the fact that I knew people in advertising who had some kind of, uh, were familiar with my work. That's how it really started. Um, subsequently, I think that the film industry also realized, and the world has changed a lot, that a lot of what I write is extremely politically incorrect. A lot of what I write may not be what people want to put money behind. But that's okay, because I'm not here to make movies, I'm here to write novels, and I'm here to flex that creative freedom and say what I think needs to be said. So how are you so funny? I mean, you're literally funny, and I'd like to tell people that very often. I mean, your belly laugh out loud funny, your lampshade and bedside table and book and glass of wine and lots of laughter, spilling wine on the bed funny. <laughs> How do you manage to sort of consistently make people laugh so well? See, it's, um, um, I don't want to underplay it. Humor is difficult. It's not easy to write funny. Um, if you see any of the movies that people say leave your brain behind and so on, some of those movies are highly structured. They're really well thought out. And, and the humor, I think, is always... I always feel that if you want to make a heavy point, make it lightly. It'll land better, and it'll land in better soil and be more fertile as a place for people to think for themselves if it is said funny. So I think I've got a little agenda in there because while I'm being funny, I'm also sort of challenging you a little when I'm being so-called funny. I'm also questioning your notions of what is right and what is wrong when I'm being funny. And um, I guess maybe, a little bit maybe it's just that I, I just enjoy humor as well. Yeah, I think it's, what you do pull off is, is very difficult to pull off, which is this wonderful balance between, you know, sexy and romantic and also funny. And the other, I think, very, very difficult skill is to write good romance. I mean, it's very easy to write bad romance. I mean, I, I've read a few, and uh, I'm just saying. See, yeah, see, good romance is about the brain. Bad romance is about body parts. I don't write about body parts. I don't want to know what is happening in your, like, various organs, except your brain. You know, I think banter is extremely important. Eyes, maybe. Hello? Eyes, smile, yeah, banter. Ah, eyes, matlab, eye contact, you know, uh, eye contact, uh, funny things left said, left unsaid, uh, that push and pull that comes, you know, uh, that for me is really exciting and really fun. And a lot of people have told me, including my own children, that I have the brain of a 14 year old boy or girl. And uh, I think that's probably helped me in best. Like, that's my best tool while trying to write. So, Club to Death, as, as you know, is, is Anuja's latest book until her you know, yeah. upcoming release. And I'd really like you to talk about your... Yeah, no, so Club to Death is like my segue into murder mystery writing, uh, which also happened as a function of a session I attended in Kolkata, actually. Uh, there was a festival called Bloody Scotland. Yeah, and then I came for that, and that actually is the time that I thought maybe I should start writing uh, murder mysteries as well. And I wrote Clubby to Death in the lockdown when I was feeling extremely murderous myself, having been, you know, I was incarcerated in this house with my husband and my children and my housekeeper and the dogs, and I was going mad and I wanted to kill people. So I thought, let me not actually kill people, let me do it in the fictional world. But. Um, yeah, so it led to the birth of a detective called ACP Bhavani Singh. I really enjoyed writing it. I'm currently writing a sequel. The movie rights for Clubby to Death are with Madoc Films. Uh, the movie is being directed by Homi Ajani, a director I really love and admire. And uh, yeah, that's what's happening. So I'm currently writing the second Bhavani, ACP Bhavani murder mystery, which comes out Diwali time this year. And is it also um, a club sort of upper class of the street are kind of a society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is not an upper class book. I think because of Pricey Taku Girls and Clubby to that, they've been very like uh, um, set in a certain mm -hmm. section of society. So the sequel, the title for which is not yet set, it, it's my first binary novel. 
it's I mean what you could call uh, it's a very commercial district in Bangalore. It's called Shivaji Nagar. It's kind of like the Chandni Chowk of Bangalore, you could say. And that's where that book is set. And of course, Shivaji Nagar is not posh at all. Shivaji Nagar is very. Shivaji very Nagar is not posh by any means. <laughs> it's amazing. It's lovely. It's magical. Yeah. And your your story is set there. Right? Yes. Um, and a bit more about any idea? Can you tell us a little bit about the names who's playing you? Maybe. So the exciting thing about Clubby to Death is that I have a female character who's very strong, and it was very exciting because lovely, talented Bollywood actresses wanted to play that role. You know, her name is Bambi Todi, mm. uh, which is abbreviated to BT, which my son says bad trip, bro, bad trip, bad trip, which is like. Okay. You know, it's it's more current kind of slang. So we had uh, lovely actresses wanting to play that role. All the young ones, um, Ananya Pandey, Jandi Kapoor, Sara Ali Khan. Very exciting conversations. Uh, but I cannot reveal anything yet because I've been muzzled by the studio. But Homi, Homi is on board. That's all I can say as of now. <laughs> Any favorite characters? You've written all these lovely books so far, and you know. Baz actually is Anuja's most uh, Kolkata book, so to speak. Um, but out of all these characters that you've written, and I know writers are very often in love with almost all of them. They're like your babies. But any that you know are particularly close to your heart. Well, you mentioned Baz. Baz is the most Kolkata of my books. It is set in um, in a fictional. Air Force Base called Kolai Kola, uh, which is very much, you know, set in reality, and um, I love that character. The Mr. Shan Fajdar is a little Haryanvi boy who becomes an IF pilot and fights in the War of Liberation for Bangladesh. Um, the rights for Baz are with Yashraj Films, and um, it's a book that's very close to my heart. And Ishan Fajdar is also very close to my heart. But I think as writers, we are all guilty of loving all our characters. You know, we're like mothers. We're like, isko bhi dil do, isko bhi dil do. Sab se pyar hai, and you can't really pick a favorite. So I love everyone I write, even the really evil people. I can really see where they're coming from. When I'm writing them, I'm like, ha, theek hi to hai na. He's right. He, she's completely correct. So yeah. So um, you married. An interfaith, you had an interfaith marriage way back in 1994. Now it was, of course, par for the course. It wasn't an issue. It wasn't a statement. No one even talked about it. And today, of course, uh, we live in very different times. And I'm sure there are young people in the audience and elsewhere who are watching who may well be considering interfaith, intercaste marriages. And is there anything you'd like to tell the manager? But firstly, I'd be very surprised if young people are considering marriage only, <laughs> because up to it's not even a law. <laughs> marriage, <laughs> you know. So that is a very advanced stage. But uh, yes, in the 90s, uh, interfaith wasn't a big deal at all. No one even thought about it. For my husband and me, it was more about the fact that he was from a political background. So my parents were more fussed about the fact that minister ka beta hai rather than isai larka hai. You know, that is kind of the world that. So how did that pan out? You know, marrying into a political family. Hmm. Now, there must have been pros and cons, and must have been thought processes. I, so how did all that? Work out for you. I think I was lucky enough uh, to end up with a boy and a family whose political opinions anyway vibed with what mine were. You know, so so everything that they believed in was anyway everything I believed in. So it it made perfect sense. It was very smooth. There was no issue like that. We had our Samaji wedding. We had a church wedding. We got to wear all kinds of clothes and party in many ways. So. That's how it worked out. There was mutual respect. Mm -hmm. um, of course, those were completely different times, you know. Yeah. One uh, question that I suppose I consider deeply personal, so I'm going to call it a deeply personal question. You, uh, uh, that I had your earlier books, of course, uh, it says that you're a practicing Catholic. And of course, you mentioned that you had a recent 
crisis of faith. Ha. So about this. So I was a you know I grew up in a Fauji family. In an army family we had there was no concept. We didn't my parents for whatever reason we didn't go to a temple, we didn't have any pujas, we were just Fauji kids. Uh, all our role models and the things we were doing and that the things we were aspiring to do came out of novels. So for me I got more idea what is a perfect woman from little women than I got like from Sita Mata, for example, you know. So it was that kind of a background. My husband was a very devout Catholic, but it didn't seem important at that point when we got married. Eight years into my marriage, I realized he was a bit of a sleeper Asian for Catholicism, and it sort of came out. And uh, for a while there, I must say, I was very into it, you know, and... Uh, um, I, anyway, to cut a long story short, I've reached a phase where I feel that I'm deeply suspicious of organized religion. It's not just a Catholic faith or, um, you know, um, any faith, anyone. So wh whether you make me meet, I am deeply suspicious of middlemen. So middlemen in any faith, you know, Christianity, Hinduism, Sikhism, uh, Islam, I'm deeply suspicious. I don't want anybody interfering and telling me this is the way, that is the way, all that kind of thing. Uh, I feel that the worst horrible things, the worst things in the universe have happened in the name of religion. So I think I'm just post-religious. I'm suspicious and scared. I'm generally afraid of people who feel strongly about the faith. Honestly, that, that's the place that I have reached. And... Um, I feel that it's so much better if we focus on com you know, things that we have in common. Common yeah. decency, common kindness. Ha! Ah, let's just, why can't we be that? Why can't we be honest and kind and brave and creative and generous? Why are these not things that we can bond over without dragging like faith into it? Because um, like when people say faith, I'm like, hi, 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 bago, bago. I cannot deal with it. So I just back away respectfully and say, not for me, not my conversation. Humanism and imagination, why can't they be our gods? Um, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I have hugged Anjaya's time enough. And what I am fairly sure a bunch of you are sitting here for is to ask her your own questions. So, um, how much time do you have, Pratiti? Like, what's, anyone's got a, what's the time? I'm clockless. I'm clockless. You have some time? We have about 15, 20 minutes. So I'm going to take a few questions and come back to the chat. Okay, so any questions right now? Fantastic. Hi, Anuja, ma'am. Hello. Um, you obviously won't recognize me, but uh, we met five years ago when Baz released, and we were a group of schoolgirls. Hi, how are you going to stand up so you can see me? <laughs> Where are you? Okay. Here I am. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. So back in 2017, when Baz was released, we went to your book signing event in Story, and uh, we kind of take photographs and stuff. And after that, I went back home, and I tried to read Baz, and right before the final chapter, I stopped because I didn't want to go into depression because I knew Ishan Fajda's fate after that because all of my friends and I at school had kind of discussed it. But I just want to ask you as an author, what are the things that goes through your head while killing off a character? And as you mentioned, your favorite character, Ishan Fajda. So hi, hi. Have you heard the spoilers? <laughs> I'm it's been five years, and I've been wanting to ask this for a while, so. <laughs> no, yeah, sure. Um, see, you're saying that you see Amir Bell. Anyway, it's a spoiler now. Everyone knows you shan't watch that dies. But that doesn't mean please pick up bars. It's a lovely book. I have it with um, right now. But, and you're banned from asking any question when I'm not in the story. Yes. I, didn't so not I, didn't I didn't read it yet. I didn't read it yet. No, but I'll tell you. Uh, for a young boy joining the forces, I mean, see, I'm not a young boy joining the forces. I can flex some kind of defense creds because my dad was in the army. All my uncles were. In 1971, nine men from my family were serving. 
बट एक्चुअली वैट हैपीज टू ईशान इज अ फेरी टेप यू नो ही डाइज अ हीरो people know that he's a hero he saves people and even the big medal that doesn't happen for 99% of the boys who actually end up that place so you know you can say that ishan is a sad ending but let me tell you it is a fairy tale ending thank you ma'am i'm so sorry about this spoiler <laughs> um we can give the mic to you but again for heaven's sake don't 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 give away with the modules and all that you know it is just to ask questions okay so uh, i uh, get to interact a lot work a lot with uh, sainik school students army school students and all that and uh, they have uh, a lot of interest in uh, uh, ai assisted writing so do the multinationals your views on that अरे नहीं होगा ए आई कैन टेक अवे एवरी बडी जॉब्स बट इट कैन नॉट टेक अवे द जॉब्स ऑफ राइटर्स एंड स्पेशली राइटर्स ऑफ रोमांस आई रियली फील दिस बिकॉज ऑफ यू रोमांस इज ऑल अबाउट अनसर्टिनिटी ऑफ वॉट यू डू नॉट यू डोंट नो वॉट्स कमिंग यट इट्स अनस्क्रिप्टेड इट्स फ्रेश एवरी टाइम एंड दैट इज समथिंग ए आई कैन जस्ट नॉट राइट so that's something i'm pretty cocky about we we'll write some gamba ghatiya kind of romance unse nahi hoga that's all right yeah the gentleman there yellow t-shirt yeah i'd like you to ask your question now yeah hi ma'am so the first thing i like to say is your energy is super god like means i have been a fan of you the question that i want to ask is actually i'm a writer myself as well the thing that i struggle with is to conceptualize new ideas so what is the process behind conceptualizing new ideas like you've done advertisement as well and written new books means how what the process is like see i think the most important thing is to reach inside your own experiences like something your your most pure data is what has happened to you aapki life mein jo hua hai use that What happens is that when we sit down to write a book, our mind, what we have seen in movies, what we have seen in books, what we have heard in songs, that starts playing in our mind. Don't let, don't be seduced by that easy path. You think about what has happened in your life, what has been your journey in life experience. Use that. That is real. You know. And it's a little tough because believe me, it's very easy. You slide down that easy road, and you sort of you know the beats, you know how it moves, you know the rhythms of that kind of writing. Don't go there. You go by what has happened in your real life. What are the real life experiences you've had? The reactions you've got? The unscripted stuff. That is what you should use. That is what will make your writing fresh and unique to you. Then it's your writing. It's all generic. Actually, Anuja, I have a question related to his one. It's a good question, by the way. Which is, what is your view on all these genres that publishers tend to bucket books in? You know, your either YA or your chick lit or your kid lit or your literary fiction. And when you grew up, you just knew there were good books and bad books and thin books and fat books. If you were, uh, you know, one of those kids, but. So what do you think about? I think it makes life easy for publishers, but that doesn't mean that we all have to act like publishers. You know, we are we are readers. I'm going out there with 500 rupees. There are so many books I can buy. I'm not going to buy saying that oh, I need a murder mystery to read, or a book to read, or a fiction to read. Now and I'll buy some. We don't think like that as readers. So the genres I think are unavoidable for. marketing people in publishing to sort of figure out their calendar and put the money in different different uh, baskets you know so it makes sense for them but i don't think that's a trap that reader should fall for yeah okay um we've got a few hands up uh gentleman in blue shirt Ma'am, I regularly keep on reading your uh, fortnightly article in the Week magazine, 
and very honestly speaking, I have not yet read your single fiction. Now, listen in your imagination, if I live for another 20 years and keep on reading your article that's coming on a magazine and 15 days uh, gap, I do not read your any fiction. Will that be good enough to know Anuja Chauhan completely? Or there will be an incompleteness. If I do not read your fiction, if I only read your political article that's coming in Vic. I've never been asked a question like that. That's an amazing question. <laughs> I've been writing for the week for more than 12 years now. Thank you. <laughs> amazing. So um, it, it's my way of keeping my um, deadline muscle tone. You know, because they send me that email on Friday evening saying your column is due on Tuesday, and you know you have to spit out that column whether you like it or not. And uh, now that I no longer have a salary, the week is very important to me because it's regular money, mm -hmm. it's a regular deadline, and I don't like to miss it. So, yeah, it, it it's very important for me. Um, maybe. Yeah, actually, I mean, you could just do that. Maybe you could just leave the columns. Um, but in fiction, I think I just tend to be much more irreverent, much more over the top. I get to explore more and to be very, very politically incorrect. And uh, I fiction ka, fiction ka maza alag hai. You know, uh, I, I enjoy both forms, but try a book, yeah. Try at least one book. <laughs> That's a bit like saying, you know, because you sing this kind of music, and you sing that kind of music, so maybe Hindustani classical and popular Hindi film music, if I just listen to your Hindustani classical, do I get a complete flavor yeah, yeah, sure. you as a musician? Yeah. Perhaps yeah. you want to try a little bit. But yeah. question, different kind of question anyway. I had a couple of hands up there. We've got a little more time. We've got maybe two to three questions more. The gentleman in the brown shirt you've been yeah 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 you've been putting your hand up for a long time what i'd like to do uh, since um, a couple of your books are going for the film adaptation so uh, when the cinematic interpretation that's often different from the book so do you frankly like uh, the interpretation or do you and uh, you know, how do you think that they just uh, screwed up the uh, writing? So what's your actual feeling about the cinematic interpretation of your books? See, it's, uh, I, as a reader, I never liked the movies. Uh, as a reader of books that I have loved, and that then get later made into movies. You know, as a child, I read all the Narnia books, for example, and I loved the Narnia books. And when I look at Azan in the movies, he doesn't look like the Azan I imagined. Um, any book, you know, the boy in the striped pajamas, or matlab um, kuch uh, bhi Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, Princess Diaries. These are my favorite books. Um, um, the literary potato peel by society, Guernsey. I always feel that the book is better than the movie because in the book, the movie plays in your head. And in your head, what you imagine is so customized to you. So that is always the most magical and the best. And when you read the book, you don't know the twist. You don't know, for example, if you're talking clubby to that, you don't know the murderer when you're reading the book. When you go to see the movie of a book you've read, you know everything. And you sort of own it. And you say, oh, God, of course, God, yeah, no. so you've got a bit of that attitude, you know. So personally, I feel that the book is never, ever as good as the movie. That's my thinking. And similarly then, also for my books, but as a writer, um, as a writer in India, who survives entirely on my writing as a writer, I cannot exactly. afford to not respect the movie industry. When they come calling, I get very excited. I light Agarbatti, I do Arti, I put, you know, some Rangoli and I say, please come. Because it means that my writing is being read by more people. My audience is growing. I might get invited to Kolkata literally meet, you know, because they'll say her book got made into a movie. So I respect the medium completely as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, We've got time for two more questions, I think, unless you've been booted out, otherwise we'll just continue. Uh, 
the lady at the back. Yeah? Yeah, the striped shirt. Oh, oh, oh. Mm. Okay. Mm. Hi, I'm uh, This is Anisha here. Uh, first of all, I really like how humorous you are, and I think uh, a lot of people will really agree with me. Like, it's very difficult to make people laugh on the normal statement. I think, thank you for that. Uh, my question to you is as a writer. <coughs> Uh, more often than not, I have written stories which uh, have left me wondering that uh, I have two alternative endings for it. And I love both of them equally. So you as a writer, is uh, like, have you ever faced that kind of a difficulty where you are thinking that you have a perfect alternative ending to your book, but uh, then you choose to go with one, and what are the factors that make you decide that whether this one will be the greater one or this one will be the one that should be there? Okay. Um, yeah, that's a pretty deep and hard question to answer there. But I think it's your knowledge of the character. If you're writing a character and you feel that ye banda essa hai, this is the DNA of this person, this is what moves him, these are her flaws, these are her insecurities, this is what gets her going, this is what will give her closure. Your knowledge of the character will dictate the ending. And it may not be the most popular ending, it may not be the ending that makes readers feel happier, but you have to be true to the character you've written. You can't write something that is not true for them. So that's it. In a sense, it's kind of like non battle of a real mummy ji. But you know, you have children, they grow up. And there's a certain point where you have to let them live their own life. And say, this is your thing, beta, to kar jo karna hai. I mean, beyond the point, umbilical cord, whiplash apart, you lead your own life. Characters are similar. So I think if you've written the characters strongly enough and you know them intimately enough, you will know what is the correct ending for them. Anuja, you have your eye on somebody wanting to ask a question who's so wonderfully keen that you spotted her out in the crowd and would you like to pick her out? Yes. If she's... Yes, yeah, sure, please. She needs a mic though, the girl in the striped t-shirt. The mic will reach you. Yeah, the girl in the striped t-shirt. Could be a title. <laughs> Hello Anuja, this is Shivangi and I'm here with my mother today, she also works in advertising and this is my very first interaction with you, I have seen my friends pick up your book and I read the title you know by Anuja Chauhan and I leave here today only more motivated to read your book but my question here unlike uh, the other viewers um, isn't about how you write or you know how you're motivated to write but I relate to your energy because you're very bubbly. I like the way you talk and I like the way you're sitting right now and it totally makes me feel more liberated. And this is something that I struggle with so I wanted to ask you, you as somebody who's so candid and as somebody who just, uh, you know, so honestly admitted that you do not feel the pressure to be politically correct all the time, was this how you were since you were a child or is this something that you, is this a practice that you evolved into? Were there hurdles along the way? Did you feel the pressure to be politically correct at some point? That is my question to you. So yeah, that's a really good question and uh, uh, has a lot of depth. And it's very true. I think it's not just me, it's all girls and women. We, are, we, we sort of feel that we should play to a particular script, you know, um, be like the girls who get to be heroines in movies, you know, virtuous, fasty, you know, girl ga hai. There's, there's a certain notion of what a heroine or like lead character energy is like. Uh, and it's very easy to fall into that and kid yourself that that is the real you, you know. But I think as you go along, you, you sort of actually suss out who you really are. And with every decade, I find women get more and more unapologetic and more and more like, this is me, like, you know, I'll like deal with it. So, um, I'm currently, like, battling the throes of menopause. And <laughs> it's like, oh. And I think with every decade, I'm like, no, I'm not But I'm just saying that it's, everybody likes girls. Girls are sweet, biddable, they do what they're told. Nobody likes women. Yeah, yeah, we're not just 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 we're just not sure. We get into it. You're just difficult then, yeah. You're just difficult. And you talk back and you argue and you're inconvenient and you're sort of holding up the traffic. But um, it's great. It's good for your health. 
If you want to just let things out to say what needs to be said, um, not internalize it and make yourself ill with you know stuff that's all like caught up in you. So um, I'm all for it. Uh, like you said, yeah, we we all spent our twenties and our teens very much. I was only large, I was only a mother. You know, I was only pretty. I didn't know. I felt I was performing. Whether you're performing for. Young girls today, whether this is how girls behave in pornography, so I should not dance like this when I go out to a discotheque. Whatever it is that you feel that is a prescribed role that you have to play, like it's great, man. Just like do it. You're earning your own money, you're your own woman. You're only answerable to anyone. Do what you want, live how you want. Yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> On that fantastic note, I'm going to close this session. Anuja, you've been absolutely lovely. Thank you very, very much. Thank I you. Thank you. <laughs>